So hi and welcome to my talk on Guerrilla Framework Design. We, um, so my name is Andreas Hjokansson, but most people might know me as the Code Junkie on Twitter. And I work a lot on writing open source, open source software and I have a slight obsession on writing frameworks. Uh, one of the frameworks that I've created is called Nancy, which is an open source web framework for the .NET framework that is one of the top five C-sharp projects on GitHub. I also work for a living. So I work at a company called 1337 or 1337 as a software consultant. So I'm just not an open source hipster. <laughs> so the first thing that I want to establish here is that there's a huge difference between writing code that's meant to be consumed by ourselves and code that we're intending for someone else to use. So when it comes to building a framework, for the most part, we, we write it with the intention of having someone else use it. So we need to think about this fact. So because of that, I like to think about building a framework as having two parts. The first part being all about writing the features and the functionality that we want the framework to, to have. And this is also the, the part of the building process that developers are the most comfortable with because the intent of any framework is to take a set of problems and reduce or completely eliminate them from our daily work. And as a programmer, as a developer, when we're faced with a problem, we all know what happens, right? Our brain immediately goes like, challenge accepted. And we want to figure out how we can solve this problem. Our mind, it immediately starts to race. We get all these ideas how we can solve the problem. If we only apply this algorithm here, we can use this design pattern to solve this problem. So it's almost like we're in the matrix. We can see the code scrolling by our eyes that we need to write. So this is what we love to do. We love to solve problems. We get paid to solve problems. But that's not enough. Because the second part is, when we have our little feature, or the features that we want to build, we need to take all of these and package them up in a nice and easy to use API. So when we're building normal applications that target the web, mobile, or desktop, we often talk about the need or the use to create a good user experience. And what that means is that not only do we want a user interface that's beautiful and informative, but we also want a user interface that, it, that expresses its intents and capabilities in a clear and concise manner. And building a framework is no different than building an application because guess what? The API of a framework, that is the user interface that users are going to use when they consume our framework. So we have to think about the same terms of usability when designing our APIs. And if we try to do this too late in the process of building a framework, or if we completely ignore it, we might end, end up building this. And <laughs> if you're the guy that comes along and you're going to use a framework that's designed like this, you're going to go, what is this? How do I use it? What am I supposed to do? Where do I start? And that's not the experience you want to give your users. But they've actually downloaded your code and they want to use it. So, And truth be told, as developers, we have a tendency to follow the path of the least resistance, right? So the thing that's the most easy is the thing that we're going to use. And that's the thing that's going to rise to the top. And we want our frameworks to be at the top. We want to be used. We don't want to be discarded because we don't have a good user ex experience. So when we look at add a feature at the NASA framework, we start by thinking about what is the user experience of this feature going to be like? What's the code going to look like that we want our users to write to consume that feature? We spend quite a lot of time iterating over this, trying out different configurations, different syntaxes, and just, just typing them out in a simple text editor that gives you an idea if this code is nice and intuitive to write. And once we've st established the syntax we want to use, we try and, and work our way backwards. So can we actually? make C sharp, which is the language of our choice. Can we make C sharp conform to the API that we want? And quite often we do, a, we abuse the language a bit. We try to use features and functionality to provide a syntax instead of writing the kind of code we want. So um, more than often we are able to, a couple of times I've sent John Skeet a tweet and I've asked, K K is it possible to make C sharp do this? And unfortunately, most of the time the answer is no. <laughs> so then back to square one, we start designing a new syntax, right? So the, the uh, 
throughout this presentation, we're going to look at a couple of the things that we do in ASI to provide a good user experience. And the code that we're going to be mainly be focusing on is the code that's shown on the screen. And if you never used NASI before and this code just look totally alien to you, don't, don't worry because using NASI is not a prerequisite, even though you should be using it. But so what this code does here is you can think of this as a controller action in uh, ASP.NVC. So this is what we call a route handler. And the route handler here says that when an HTTP GET request comes in that matches the pattern defined within the square brackets, the code within that function is going to be executed and whatever that function returns will call return back to the sender. Now, even though that code might look very simple, truth be told, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to enable our users to write such clean and expressive code. And we're going to look at a couple of those things. We're going to focus on five areas. The first one is the use of Dynamics. So Dynamics isn't anything new. It was introduced back in, I think, early 2010. So it's over three years old. But still, this is something that, to many developers, is something that's still very foreign, and we don't see it a lot in framework design. But we have, uh, we have embraced it a lot, and we use it in, in a different place, a, a whole bunch of places in ASI. So within this route handler, we can see that we're actually passing in a variable called parameters, right? And on that variable, we're accessing a property called name. So just standard C-sharp code. But the truth is that name does not exist on the variable that the parameter is. In fact, it doesn't contain any public properties at all. It doesn't contain any methods at all. It is a special dynamic type that we have implemented in Nancy to provide you to be able to write this kind of syntax. So what happens is, normally, if you try to write this code and you don't have the parameter, the compiler is going to step in and he's going to say, whoa, whoa, hold, hold, hold. Uh, what are you trying to do here now? I see you're going to trying to access a property call name, but I know for a fact that parameters does not have a property call name. So I'm not even going to try and build your code. You fix that and you come back when you're ready to talk again. So now, when we switch over to dynamic world, the compiler takes a step back and he says, okay, fine. You want, to, you want this code to be dynamic. So I'm going to give you the responsibility of making sure that this code executes well at runtime. If it blows up, that's your problem. I gave you a warning, so all bets are off. So when, when an HTTP request comes in that matches that pattern, what happens in Nancy is that we take the value of the URL that matches the pattern, we look at the name of the capture parameter, which is, in this case is name, and we stick that into our dynamic type as a key value pair. Then at runtime, when we try to read the value back out, the dynamic type is going to infer the name, and it's going to, it's going to go and say, OK, so I see you're going to try and access a property called name. It just so happens that I have a piece of information stored with the key of name. So I'm just going to make the assumption. That's the piece of information you want, so I'm going to give it to you. And that's what makes it possible to write code like this that doesn't break the compiler and doesn't break at runtime. And we use this at quite a lot of places. So for another example is when accessing query string values in your route handler. You can access that in the same dynamic fashion. So you just do type query dot and the name of any query string key that you want and you get the value back, assuming that the key exists, of course. We also use it for things like uh, accessing posted form data and looking up localized text versions in views. And it's very easy to write code like this. So let's step over and see what code, what the code could look like. I could find my mouse pointer. So in this sample, we have created a simple class called capitalizer. Now, this is a dynamic type. And if we look at what we're doing with the class, we're assigning a couple of properties. Again, these are just dynamics, so they don't exist. And then we're writing them back out to the console. But the beautiful thing about dynamics is not only can we just create, write less code and have properties that doesn't exist, exist at runtime, but we actually get full control of what code we want to execute when the dynamic operation takes place. So this means that we can add additional behavior to our dynamic, dynamic operations. And in the case of the capitalizer, what this means is whatever you put into the properties, when you're reading them back out, 
we're always going to give you them as the uppercase version. So we're going to assume as well that whatever you're putting in the property is going to be a string. Now, if you look at the capitalizer itself, the important thing to notice here is that we're, we're inheriting from a class called dynamic object. And dynamic, dynamic object is part of the .NET framework, and it's a helper class that provides an abstraction for consuming or reacting to dynamic operations and objects. And it provides a nice abstraction for dealing with property accesses, method calls, indexers, and all kinds of other operations. And there is also ways that we can drop further down and get access to the raw dynamic data. But for the most part, this is where you want to stay around because you basically override a couple of methods and you add your code in there what, what the, uh, the added behavior you want. So in the, came, in the case of properties, we are overriding a member called try get member and try set member. And these are called when we write, read or write to a property, right? So in the case when we write our values back in, into dynamic type, the try set member is going to be called. And, from the, and for that operation, we get a binder. And on that binder, we can figure out the name of the property that's being called. And we use that name just to take the value and store it in, in an internal dictionary, that's all. And the same is when we try to read it out. But that, that time, the try get member is going to be invoked. So at the same time, uh, uh, sorry, at the exact at same way, we try to infer the name of the property that you're accessing. We take the inferred name, we use that as the key in the dictionary. We grab the value, but before returning it, we turn it back up to uppercase. So if we look at what we run this code, we can see that we get the upper curse, uppercase versions out, even though we put in uh, with a lot of lowercase. And there's really no limits to what kind of code you can put in these actions. I mean, what, the ever, whatever kind of action you need to take when the dynamic operations are invoked, feel free to just add them. You can add logging if you want or, yeah, whatever. For instance, when we, when we try to get localized texts out from views, we, we call to an entire different subsystem within Nancy that can go and look for uh, text in resource file or databases or call it from a translation service. And it's all transparent to users. All they know is that they access a property that makes sense to them. And by implementing such simple types as the capitalizer or other dynamic types, it helps our users to write more expressive code. There is no need for us to create a static type parameters variable and tell the framework that this is the data we want to ship in. Nor do we have to access the value through some sort of indexer or a dictionary lookup. Now, if you look at the code again, we can see that it returns in a, different, a couple of different places. So the first return is going to return an instance of a JSON response object. The second one is returning an enum value, and the third one is actually returning something that's an action of stream. Now, no, again, nothing out of the ordinary if we expect the return type to be object, but we don't. The, the expected return type is actually an object called response, but this code still compiles and it executes. And the way that the way that we do this is, normally if we try to compile this code, again, the compiler would step in, be a nice guy, say, no, no, no. You're trying to return an enum value, but I need a response object, so I'm not going to let you compile this code. You come back when you fixed it. So what we've done is we'd start to look at what kind of data is people most likely going to res return from their action result, from their, sorry, from their route handlers. And we, we identified subclasses of the response type as the first one. We wanted them to be able to just return a status code or a, a more complex version where we write the response team. But you can actually just return a string as well or just an integer. And what we did is we took all of these, these return types that we thought would be the most likely to be returned. And we went back to our response object and we added the capability of marshalling between these two worlds, of costing between these two worlds. So when the compiler comes by and says, I actually need a response object, but you gave me an integer, then the response object is going to be able to step in and say, that's fine, because if you give me that integer value, I'll give you a response value back based on that integer value. So we're, let's be cool with this. Let's just run with it, and I'll make sure you get the instance back at runtime. <laughs> 
So we applied a, ba a set of conventions based on the return value. So we assume that if you return a string, you're more, most likely wanting to return a response value with the content of that string set to the, to, uh, the content, sorry, the value of that string set to the content of the response. Likewise, if you return an integer value or an HTTP status code enum value, you're more than likely want to return a status a response value with the status code set to that value. So we apply those set of conventions. And the way that we did that is with the help of the implicit cast operator overloading support in C sharp. And if we look at a very basic sample, We have a very simple framework that ha just has two methods, return content result and return status code result. And in the default implementation, we see that we create a new instance of the result object, we set the content and return it. Likewise, for the status code one, we create a new instance, we set the status code and return it. But the code that we actually want our users to be able to write are the second version. So we just want to be able to return the plain string or the plain uh, integer value. And the way that we do this is that we drop back down into our result object and we implement two implicit cast operator overloads. So what the first one tells is when, when you get a integer value but you expected a response, uh, sorry, a result value, if you give me that integer, I'll create the result I'll set the status code for you, and I'll give you the configure object back. And you can just return that from the method instead. Likewise, we do the same for the string, except we write it back to the content. Now, running this code, and we can actually see that the first one printed out a result object. It's maybe not that clear, but it printed out a result object with the content set to the string. The second one printed out a result of it with the status code set to that integer. So if you, when you're implementing this kind of stuff in your framework that where you're going to want the user to return a couple of different things, you don't want the user to have to walk through a lot of red tape and add a lot of ceremony. There's no need for them to explicitly new up like a new status code response object or a new content response object. Or like we had in the, in the default case, return a plain object and set a property on it and return it. Just look at what the return values are, extract those and apply the implicit cast operator conventions on them and you, your users will get to write a lot more expressive code. That's what you really want. You want people to write application code. You don't want people to write framework code. The less the framework gets in your way, the better it is. If we look at the first return again, I told you before that that's going to return an instance of a JSON response object. That's a special subclass of the response object, which takes any data you pass into it, it JSON serializes it before returning it to the caller. And we added a couple of these to Nancy. We added one for XML serialization. We have the JSON one. We have one if you want to return a file back to the, to the caller. And when we started to add more and more of these, we started to think a lot about how discoverable are these new subclasses to our users? How can we make it obvious to people that these classes actually exist so they don't either have to fall back to reading the source code, God forbid they read documentation, or, or, or perhaps even write their own implementation just because they don't know that these things exist. So what we came up with was this very simple idea that we call marker interfaces. And what a marker interface is, it's just an empty interface declaration, no public methods or members or whatever on it. We give it a name that makes sense within the context that it's going to be used. And what we then do is that we hide that interface behind a property with a name that makes sense within the context that the user is going to write code. So for instance here, we're, we have hidden a marker interface behind a property called response. But what that, even though that property uh, you know that though that interface doesn't have any public members at all. What it allows us to do is actually add extension methods on that uh, interface type. So when the user in Nancy types response and hits dot, in their IntelliSense, all the available extension methods are going to show up. So you'll immediately see the extension method as JSON, you'll see as XML, as file, and the, all the other response types that we have. 
So you'll immediately know what kind of response capability you have out of the box. But we also noticed that it doesn't solve just our problem of making things more discoverable, but what if any of you guys sat down, you use Nancy, and you say, I need this custom response type. But I think it's going to be useful for someone else. So I want to packet it up in a NuGet and publish it. And then the next guy comes along and he says, oh, this sounds really useful, the, the extension that he created. So I'm, just, I'm going to install the NuGet in my project and I want to use it. If the author of that extension, sorry, that response type also ships an extension method on the marker interface, you're immediately going to discover it as a, an available response type just because they add an extension method to that interface. And the implementation for this is so simple. I, I told you, it's just an, a plain old interface declaration with no members on it. <coughs> so in our fictive world here, we have a base class that's intended for the users of a framework to inherit from, Impl provide them implementation of the get response method. And then we have the marker interface for demo purposes, I'll just call it marker interface, but you should really give it a more context of weird name. And we hit that up behind the property. As we can see, we're returning nothing. So if you actually try to do something with that value, good things are not going to happen. The interface itself is just empty. The implementation that the user will provide, uh, it inherits from the base class, provides an implementation of get response, and and if we didn't have that marker interface around, they would be forced to write return new JSON response. But by just going in and adding an extension method, we can turn the first, we can change the implementation of this code to look like this. So if more of these are added in newer versions or through other dependencies, as soon as they're going to hit the dot, it's going to show up in IntelliSense, right? But it also turns out that not only does this solve discoverability for us and third-party developers, but it also helps create re more readability in the code that we write. Because if you read that code, just by giving the property a, a good name and extension method a good name, it actually reads out uh, the intent of the code. It says, return a response as JSON. So the intent of the code is very obvious as well. So that's an added bonus that we just got for free. Now, today most frameworks offer you some sort of extensibility points. So you can customize the behavior or add additional functionality to a framework, right? This is something, not something new. And the process of adding functionality to an existing framework usually consists of two parts. The first part is you take the interface or the app, base class, or whatever extensibility point they offer, and you create an implementation of that. Once you create your implementation, you need to make the framework aware of the new functionality so that it knows how to use it. And what this usually means is that you either have to go and add your new extension to some sort of collection, or you have to drop back to a config file and tell the framework about it. And if you're anything like me, you sit down with great enthusiasm, uh, you add your new feature and your new functionality, you hit F5, you browse or try to code that, that you want to try out, and it doesn't work. Scratch your head for a couple of seconds, and then it hits you. I didn't tell the framework about it. I forgot to register it. I forgot to add it to the config file. I forgot to add it to this collection. So you break out of the compiler, you go and add it, and you run your code again. So when designing the, we start to design the extensibility features of Nancy, we started to think more and more about this second step here. Is this step really necessary? Isn't this just added ceremony to? Isn't this just forcing the code to, the user to write more framework code than they should have? What if, what if we could figure out what extensions was available? What if we could go out and look through your application? We could find all these extensions that you've written. We could identify them. We'd create a new instance for you, and we'd wire them up at the right spot in the framework. So there was no need to explicitly tell us about it. We'd just figure it out for you. 
So that's the kind of functionality we started exploring with. And we came, uh, the, the base for this kind of a functionality in ANSI is the assembly scanning. And it's more or less these 10 or so lines of code, right? So what the code is going to do is it's going to scan through your app domain, go through all your app assemblies, all the types in those assemblies, and it's going to look for implementations of your extensibility types. For all those types you're going to find, you, you, that implements one of your extensibility types, you're going to get a collection back. And you can create a new instance of those types, and you can wire them up. Again, very simple implementation. More or less, the, the foundation for any of the assembly scanning are the lines of code that you see on the screen. If we look at the sample framework we've created for assembly scanning demos, we have a very simple framework that provides a greeting based on a culture that you send in. So if you tell the framework, give me a greeting for the Swedish culture, it's going to go and look for a greeting and give it back to you. In the same way, if you ask it to greet someone in the English culture, it's going to try and figure out which greeting is most, most appropriate. And the, the actual implementation of the framework is that when you create an instance of the framework, we call the assembly scanner. We try to figure out which types implement the iGreeter interface. And for each of those types, we create a new instance, and we just stick them in, in a collection internally. When the, when the user then tells the framework, I need you to provide me with the greeting for this, frame, for this culture, we look at the available greeters. Is any of the found extension, extensions a bit, uh, capable of replying to this culture? And if nobody is able to, we're just going to tell you, sorry, we can't provide you with a, with a greeting for the culture that you asked for. But if we find a suitable match, then we're going to query that implementation and return that implementation to, uh, sorry, that greeting to the user. And we can see that it uses the same sort of assembly scanning code as we saw on the slide. There's been no modifications to that code whatsoever. So we, we start off by creating a simple implementation for greet someone in Swedish. But if we can see in the code up at the top, we also want to provide a greeting for English-speaking users. But So if we run this code, it's going to provide a greeting for Swedish, which is hi. But it's going to tell us, but sorry, but I'm, I wasn't able to find someone to provide me with the greeting for English. <laughs> so if we go back to our code, we just add another implementation of that framework. Now, again, all we did was create an implementation of the iGreeter interface. We've not told the actual framework about it. But when we run our code the second time, we noticed that this time we also be, we we're also able to get a greeting back for English. <coughs> now, this provides almost a magic experience for the users of the framework. We've often gotten comments back on ANSI about that this gives the, the user a sense of real control, a, a sense of power, because they just sit down, they add the functionality that they want to write. They don't want to write framework code. They want to write application code. When the, once they have the application code that they're happy with, they can run their application, and the functionality will just be available. Now, we apply a simply more complex version of the assembly scanning in ANSI, and I would suggest that you invest some time in figuring out your strategy. So th uh, the things I would recommend you to do is the first one is apply some sort of caching. You're not going to want to scan through your entire app domain each and every time you want to find objects to create an instance of. If you think you're going to need multiple queries for the same type, please think about caching. And the second one, if you're looking for multiple extensibility types, so like you have an I greeter and an I say hello -er, <laughs> then you're not going to want to iterate through your entire app domain once for each of these types. So you should actually check the each type for all the extensibility types at the same time. And the third one that we apply in ANSI is that we've applied a convention that says we're only going to scan through the assemblies that actually references an ANSI assembly. Because if the assembly doesn't reference NASI, then you're not going to be containing one of our extensibility types. You have not provided us with an implementation. There's no, no point in scanning a type that doesn't 
sorry, scanning an assembly that doesn't implement one of our types. So this drastically reduces the number of assemblies that we have to scan through. Because you have to think about that in your application, not only do you have your application specific assemblies, but you're pulling in a lot of assemblies from the, from the framework as well. And some of these can be pretty huge and have a lot of public types. The fourth thing that you should consider as well, and the code actually infers this, and I will highly encourage you not to remove it, is be a good guy and don't try to create an instance of, of a, of a non-public type. I mean, if it's public, then it's fine to assume that it's one, you just want to use it. But if it's of any other kind, don't even try and create an instance of it. Mm -hmm. How do you handle uh, assemblies that are referenced by one of your assemblies but didn't get loaded into the uh, Good question. Because <laughs> as it so turns out that the C sharp compiler or the linker tries to be smart sometimes. And if there's no direct reference to a, a, a an assembly or type of a assembly, it might as well it, sometimes it optimizes it out the manifest of the assembly. So it it won't even show up as a referenced type. And the and sometimes it is, but it's not loaded into that domain. So we we actually apply a more a bit more aggressive strategy because on application startup, we'll forcefully load all the assemblies into the, into the application domain before we run the scanning code. And we apply the same, same conventions here. We'll only forcefully load those assemblies that references Nancy. And there are tricks to do this without pulling the assemblies into the app domain. So you can discard the assembly even if you don't want it. And if you want to see how this looks, I, you don't need to look, but <laughs> it's in the Nancy code and it's all open source. <laughs> and this is the last thing that we're going to look at today, but it's also the biggest, but not, not necessarily the most complex thing. Now, traditionally, when you create a framework, you have a single type that you want your user to create an instance of. And through that instance, you want them to access all the, the functionality through the framework. Now, from a code design perspective, what this all, all almost always means is that you'll start creating hard dependencies between the different types in your framework. Because you just want your user to create an instance of a type, but you need to create new instances of all the different widgets in your framework. And with all these hard dependencies, it gets very hard to write unit tests against your framework. And we didn't want that. We actually wanted to be able to cre create loosely coupled code that's fully unit testing but at the runtime, we still want to be able to give the user an instance of the framework. So we need a way to stitch all these loosely coupled parts together before giving it back to the user. So we came up with the idea of the bootstrapper. So the, the single responsibility of this bootstrapper is to find all the different Nancy types and stitch them up together so we can hand a configured instance back to our users. And the way that we solve this is our default implementation of the bootstrapper is based around a, a very simple IOC container. So in our case, it's uh, the tiny IOC IRC container, which is just a simple CS file that you drop in your project and you get a, a nice, fast, and lightweight container that you can ship within your framework. So when we start our code, we use the assembly scanning to figure out all the available Nancy types, put them inside a container, and then we, create, then we pull out the root object, the object we want to give back to the user. And when we pull that out of a container, all of the constructor dependencies will hopefully have been satisfied or we'll end up with an exception. But 99% of the time, we get a configured object that we can, buy, can give back to our users and they can start using the framework. And it also turns out that there were a couple of nice side effects to this, that because we put everything into a container, all the Nancy types that make up the framework at runtime, we noticed that if we tweak the API of our bootstrapper just slightly and gave you access to it, not only could you put your own stuff in that would propagate through the composition of the application, but you could actually reach in and pick out parts of the framework itself that you didn't like. So if you don't like how routing works in Nancy or don't like how model binding works, please just provide your own implementation and put that in the container. So when we pull the framework out of the container again, it's going to use your type instead of the Nancy type. So the, not only have you added functionality to the framework, or customized functionality, but your customized functionality is actually part of the framework. It's not over here on the side. It's part of the actual core. 
And the implementation for our bootstrapper might look a bit complex because we have a lot more files in this demo. But hopefully we can break it down. So if we look at the simple framework that we want to add bootstrapping capabilities to, this is a validation framework. It takes an arbitrary object in and it's going to tell you if this object is valid or not. And the way that it does that is that it uses something that's called an I validator. And in this case, the I validator is going to contain the business rule for what do we consider as being a valid object. So if we look at the default implementation of the validator, it takes a, de a dependency on something that's called an I validation rule. And it goes through all the, the uh, different validation rules and makes sure that all of them return true. So the business rule that this validator enforces is that all the rules have to report back that the object is okay. If not all validation rules says the object is okay, we'll not let it pass. And the validation rules are just as simple as the, the validator itself. It just takes the object, applies a rule, and returns a Boolean. Now the framework itself, it needs to figure out which validator should I use and how do I get the validation rules that the validator might need. So what it does is that it uses a bootstrapper and to figure out where the bootstrapper is, it uses a bootstrapper locator. Now what the locator is, is you can think of this as just a specialized version of the assembly scanner that's just looked for a specific type. Not only that, but it's going to to uh, make sure that, can I find something that's not called a default bootstrapper? If I can, then that's the thing I'm gonna use. Now, if I find nothing but, and only left with the default one, I'm gonna fall back to use that. And I'm gonna show you a bit later why that's important. Once it's got the bootstrapper, it's, it just asks the bootstrapper, please give me a validator. I don't care how you get it created, just give it to me. I don't care what validator it, I just need one. So when we run this code, I thought, see that when we call validator, we actually have an instance of the default validator and on that validator, we have the not null validation rule that we implemented. So the framework itself doesn't know where the validator came from, or that the validator needed a set of rules. It just pulled it out and it got a fully configured object back. Now looking at the actual bootstrapper interface, or sorry, the base class. We see our get validator method, right? The first thing that that method is going to do is ma make sure that's not been called before because if we already have a fully configured uh, instance of our framework or our framework type, there's no need to do all the assembly scanning and the composition again. So this is purely from a, from a performance point of view. We also notice that there's hardly any implementations. All these are abstract methods with the exception with telling the framework that this is a default default the validator and we have the, these validation rules. And when the initialization is called, it actually plays through a little startup script. So it's going to create an instance of the container, it's going to register the validators, and it's going to give the user a choice to put additional stuff into the container, and then it's going to consider itself initialized. Now the thing to notice here is that the abstract class here for the bootstrapper is of type T and we actually pass the container around a bit in this startup script. And why this is important is this enables us to provide multiple implementations of a bootstrapper. So in this instance, we have created a default implementation that's based on TinyIoC. So when it asks, give me an application container, we'll actually create a, a new instance of the TinyIoC container and return that. When it tells me, I, I need uh, you to register this validation type in the container. It's going to call register validator and it's going to pass in the container that we want to register in. Now why this is important and why we have not created some sort of 
container abstraction layer because not only is that hideous, but we want to give the users the full capabilities of the container that they're using. So if you're using the container that you're comfortable with, you're going to get full access to the full API when you provide your registrations and, re and um, resolve stuff. So as you can see, the, the uh, default implementation is very simple. It, it does two registrations, and it does the resolve of the actual validator. Now, the bootstrapper locator tried to find a bootstrapper that's not the default one. So if you want to create your own implementation or your users want to create their own implementation based on another container, they'll just implement a new bootstrapper type of the container class and the bootstrapper locator will figure out that that's the one you want to use. Now say that we are, uh, I'm as a user of the framework, I come along and I hate when this happens. I, I, got, I started using a framework and it covers like nine out of 10 of my use cases. And if it could just figure out how to do that 10 thing, it would be totally awesome. Now I'm just slightly annoyed that it only covers nine. So what the bootstrapper does gives us this capability that I mentioned before. We can go into the actual framework itself <laughs> and we can pull out the default validator and replace it with our own. So the way that we would do that is that we would just provide an implementation of the the iValidator interface. Now for this could have been, say, like, oh, if only 50% of the rules uh, pass, then we are fine. Or uh, if the ones that we have marked as important pass, then then it could, then we'll let the the object be valid. But for the sense of this demo, we are not going to provide implementation. Now we see that this implementation of the validator has a, a custom dependency. It needs to use an ifoo to figure out if the rule, rules are right. Now the ifoo could turn return the the number of rules that needs to be be valid before the validator says says true. So we'll just go and create that implementation ifoo. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to actually tell the framework about this, right? And the way we do that is that we inherit from the default bootstrapper. So we actually piggyback on that. We don't want to change the actual behavior. We just want to reach in and replace a certain thing. And what the way we do that is that we we inherit, or sorry, we override the validator property that was returning default, and we're going to return our type instead. So when the bootstrapper says, I need you to register a validator, it's going to pass in the new, in, the new type instead. Likewise, I, I told you that we give you an option to actually modify the container with user code as well. So in the configuration, configure application container, you get the, get the ability to actually just um, register your IFO instance as well. So if we run this code now, we notice that when we call validate, we ended up in the custom validator instead. And so we've drastically modified the behavior of the actual uh, framework by just writing a couple of lines of code. And we often get the question as of, if you're going out and scanning for all of these types and you're automatically registering them in the container, why can't you do this for things like that are core to the framework as well, like a Nancy type? And the reason is that we made a conscious decision between separate framework code and your application code. If, it, if it's extensibility points in the frameworks that's going to alter the behavior of your application, then we're going to automatically discover them. If you drastically want to change uh, default behavior of the framework, like swap out the entire uh, routing engine, then you need to be very explicit about that. So you just don't end up pulling in a NuGet and someone provided an implementation there and all of a sudden your, all your routing start, stop working. So we make a difference about framework code and application code uh, in, the se in the sense of, of extensibility points. And that's all I had, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any questions? None?
Nou. <laughs> I mean, everything is relative, right? So if you fine-tune your application to the point where actual dynamics is, is having a drastic import, uh, impact on your performance, congrats to you. Uh, that means probably that you're not using things like link statements because they're just slow as hell. So uh, we've not found it to be a performance impact at, at all at the stages that we use it, but you should definitely look at how you want to use it and you should profile your code accordingly and see if it makes sense. I think someone, yeah? So the question is, how much of design came up from design process versus just thinking them up as we code the feature? It's hard to say, but for the most part, when it's a feature that's uh, on the public API, that's, feature f that's facing the user, we try really hard to start off with figuring out what kind of syntax we want to provide, because we try to look at it from the user's point of view. Because we, we, we subscribe to a philosophy that says, we want to provide a simple and easy API. Now, if that means that, that we end up writing a lot of complex code in the framework to support that simple API to the user without sacrificing functionality, then we, we're willing to take that hit. Because the option would have been to flip the tables and create a very simple implementation. But every time that the user came around and they wanted to use that feature, they had to write a lot of complex code. So we get to write it once, and we ship it, opposed to forcing our users to do it. Anyone else? Okay, then. thank you. <laughs>